What is going on, everyone? We are live here with Gary Tobbs, and I have his new book here. It is called The Case for Keto. And for some of you newcomers, because there is a lot of newcomers around the new year here, you may not know, but Gary Tobbs is really one of the OGs in this whole low carb. Uh, this is the book actually that got me started. Good calories, bad calories. Um, I read it about, when did this one come out? I read it about five years ago, I think. Uh, I came out in 2007. Okay. Um, and if you guys are keeping track at home, the Rogan counter, Gary is number four, actually the fourth Joe Rogan guest we've had on the show. Uh, so that's just a fun tally to keep track of, but, uh, yeah, so uh, you got the new book out, and I wanted to kind of touch on this at the start because we usually get towards this at the end of the, the podcast, but for a lot of people are trying to start the diet up new this year, and they have probably been down this path a lot before. Like they're every new year, they want to start something new. They can't stick to it. You cover a lot of that in this book, but I guess what would you say are some of the major pitfalls of people like the yo-yo dieting culture, just to constantly trying to stick to something and not being successful. Well, and this is what I'm, you could argue this is why I wrote the book. Um, the conventional wisdom on dieting. I mean, we have a different diet book comes out every week, right? And a different, uh, you know, term like today it's keto, right? Uh, when I grew up, keto was Atkins. Mm -hmm. And before Atkins, there was Taller, and before Taller, there was Banting, and they're all, it's all been the same thing. And, you know, but, but that's not how we approach diets. We think, well, I'm going to do whole 30 this, I'm going to try whole 30 and whole 30 is let's do it for a month. Um, I'm going to try South Beach if that doesn't work. And what I wanted to do with this book is put in part all of this in context, which is, and put it in the right scientific context, assuming you trust my judgment on that mm -hmm. and get people off this idea that, oh, January 1st, I'm going to start trying to eat less and I'm going to eat more plants and I'm going to exercise more and all these things that arguably are not going to benefit their weight and their health in the long run. Well, not exercise is a different issue, but, and get them to understand the basic human physiology we're talking about, the textbook medicine we're talking about, and what you have to do to get lean and stay lean if you're one of us who has a natural problem being lean. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess I would kind of break down the whole argument as the people who are the calories in, calories out uh, camp, and then there's like the hormonal weight loss camp. You're obviously more in the hormonal I would say you're even a hormonal maximalist uh, to some degree. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So what's and there's not, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of overlap. Like I would consider myself someone who is is a believer mostly in hormonal, but also that there's an element of calories, obviously, for weight loss. Um, why is there not much overlap and, and like basically just break down that whole disagreement? OK, so remember, I come from the physics world originally. Uh, I studied physics. My first two books are on physics. So I like to think in terms of theory and paradigms and how you think about this. And the argument is, well, until 1930, there were two takes on obesity, basically, that these two takes. One is it's caused by eating too much. And, you know, fat people are gluttons or they're slothful and that's all there is to it. And the other is that it's a hormonal disorder, that, that people who tend to gain fat do it almost despite how much they eat. So for those of us who fatten easily, and I, that's a term right out of the 1950s era diet books, but I think it's appropriate. For those of us who fatten easily, we have two choices if we believe in the energy balance thing, which is either make sure we're, we stay hungry all the time. And actually an epigraph in Good Calories, Bad Calories was from an anthropologist who said some people are just gonna have to learn to be hungry if they wanna be lean. And so we're either hungry or we're getting fatter. Those are our two options. That's the energy balance thinking. And if you accept that obesity is a hormonal disorder, and the argument I've been making is your fat accumulation is regulated by the autonomic nervous system and hormonal responses to what you eat. And the hormone that dominates is a hormone insulin. And insulin is uh, secreted primarily in response to the carbohydrate content of the diet. So you have this uh, hypothesis says that carbohydrates are fattening. If you don't want to be fat, you can't eat them. It's just 
that simple. And so you can't go on a diet in January where you say, I'm going to give up carbs and lose 20 pounds and then go back to eating carbs, gain the 20 pounds right back and say the diet failed me. That what failed you was your thinking and your understanding of human physiology. Yeah, yeah. So having done this, we've run this channel for almost five years now, I feel like I have come to some conclusions along the way. And it seems like a lot of the reason people fail on keto is that they treat it like it is what they classically consider a diet, which you, you calorie restrict, like they start keto and they're calorie restricting at the same time. Um, do you think that's the route to go? Or do you think the idea is just lower the carbs, the calories come down the road, naturally? Uh yeah, and I, I, the idea is, <clears throat> excuse me. The idea here is, is okay, so your fat tissue, when I say it's regulated by insulin, insulin stimulates fat uptake in your cells and it inhibits the release of fat from your fat cells. And so if your insulin's elevated and your fat cells, the, the term used by the metabolism researchers I interviewed back when these guys were still alive is they are exquisitely sensitive. Fat cells are exquisitely sensitive to insulin. So if you got a little bit of insulin in your bloodstream, you're gonna accumulate fat. But your fat cells are gonna accumulate fat and it's gonna inhibit the release of that fat. And so, you know, that's what we're trying to, 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 to achieve is, is get the fat out of the fat cells and you do that by lowering insulin. Um, thinking of it as a diet is just you know it's bound to lose but there are many different ways you could lose if you try if you if you're mobilizing fat from your fat cells if your insulin is low the rest of your body will be burning fat for fuel you won't be hungry in effect your cells are being fed and that's all your brain is concerned with your brain is monitoring the fuel availability in the periphery um if you try to cut calories uh, you could short circuit it. If you try to cut fat, you could short circuit it. This is, and again, one of the things I did in this book is I interviewed with 120 physicians. Many of them probably listen to your podcast. These are people who have converted to thinking the way we think. And I asked them, what are the challenges to your patients? And, and then often it's, you know, well, okay, maybe, you know, tabs, these people are right about carbs, but I'm also going to restrict my fat. So I'm going to have vegetables and low fat, you know, skinless chicken breast. Mm -hmm. And it's all going to be made in a wok, you know, without yeah. any fat. And then your calories are coming from whatever carbs are in the vegetables and the protein and a little bit of fat and the chicken breast. And you're basically, you're still going to be stimulating some insulin and you're going to be hungry all the time because you're not getting enough calories. So it could be calorie cutting, it could be fat cutting. There's also a possibility that some people don't get enough protein. I kind of, that's what Ted Naiman believes and I, I respect, I think he's wrong, but I, I, he's also a smart guy and he's got a lot of clinical experience. So there are yeah. a lot of ways it could go wrong. And what I tried to do in this book is say, look, here's how to think about it. This is what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to minimize your insulin levels and maximize your calories. Uh -huh. And if you can do that, you'll be happy, you'll be sated, you'll be able to eat foods you like, and you're, you should be minimizing your fat accumulation or, you know, getting lean and healthy in the process. So that's, that's probably the major disagreement then, because we did have Ted Naiman on a couple months ago, maximizing calories, that is not something humans do these days, we're supposed to minimize calories or okay, haven't you well, got I should, the memo? Yeah, <laughs> I should, I should rephrase that you should be eating to satiety. Yeah. OK, that if you're walking away hungry, the diet's going to fail. And if mm -hmm. you're walking away hungry, it's a sign that the diet is failing, weirdly enough. Yeah. OK, because yeah, yeah. if you if if what we're doing is, you know, to really I've been obsessed with homeostasis lately. OK, um, somebody everybody's got to be obsessed with something. The Netflix shows we've been watching haven't been that good. Um, yeah, they're really bad lately. You know, there's, I mean, there's a gazillion shows to watch. It just depends on what you're choosing. I was just yeah. thinking about, maybe I should just do a podcast about, you know, Netflix. what foreign TV shows we should be watching. Um, we'll get to that at the end. Uh, the original idea with homeostasis, so it dates to this, the brilliant, legendary French physiologist, Claude Bernard, and the idea that Bernard's insight was that the body, for any living organism, multicellular organism to survive, what it's got to do 
is maintain stability of the internal environment. So basically it's got to keep its cells alive and its cells are only are dependent on what they see in their internal environment, which is in the circulation. They're also enervated by the autonomic nervous system. So they get signals from the nervous system, but they're only seeing what's in the circulation. So the circulation and, and the fat cells are responding to that. And all they see are hormonal signals and the amount of fat and the amount of carbs, the fuel available to respond to those hormonal signals and do what those hormones want it to do. And they don't know how much you're eating and exercising. Mm -hmm. They don't know whether you're overeating or under eating, but if they're working properly, they're taking up calories after a meal and they're releasing the calories in between meals. And the lean tissue is burning those calories because they're getting the right hormonal signal to take up glucose or to take up fatty acids. And they don't know how much you're eating and exercising. So yeah, it's when I say maximize calories, I mean, your body's healthiest when it's well fed, which is different than force feeding it or overfeeding it or, you know, a lot of these terms are tautological. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're constantly trying to underfeed it as a way to force your fat tissue to give up fat, basically it's not going to work. My belief is eventually it's going to fail because you're trying to hack a homeostatic system that can't be hacked like that. I think we've all been there for the most part. The uh, conscious calorie restriction that leads to the eventual rebound. And most people that probably discover keto or find our channel they've been through a few iterations of this this process the biggest loser style diets where you're exercising a lot counting calories so someone who's coming from that situation probably has some degree of just like an unhealthy mindset maybe some metabolic damage what is just like the few the handful of things you can do to really get started in the right direction and make lasting changes okay well i want to make one point also which is this was one of the revelations in writing this and doing the research was we all go through that. You cannot be burdened with obesity or overweight in 2021 and not at one point in time or multiple points in time have gone on diets and tried to lose weight. And at one point I wanted to call this book in praise of fad diets because the reason why fad diets exist is because the conventional wisdom fails. Yeah. And it, it's almost guaranteed to have failed virtually every obese. I mean, maybe there are a few that didn't try. And you could argue, and the, the conventional wisdom is it doesn't fail them. These people don't have willpower. And then you get into fat shaming and all of that. But the, the, the gist of it is the conventional wisdom has failed us all. So then we eventually get to, you know, you'll try a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet or, you know, the whatever starch diet. If those didn't work, then Part of the reason I wrote this is try a low carb, high fat ketogenic diet. We know it's healthy. We've got a hundred clinical trials telling that that the best tested diet in history now. And so what do you do? What does it mean? And it, they, what it means is pretty simple. That you, starches, sugars, and grains are fattening. For those of us who get fat and we can't eat them. Um, that includes most fruit. So for those of us that get fat, that's uh, expand on that a little bit. Yeah, the argument is, you know, those of us who get there aren't multiple reasons. I mean, there are multiple reasons why people get fat. There are a lot of hormones and every hormone influences fat accumulation. Right. So, you know, uh, sex hormones influence fat accumulation. Some can be very uh, have some genetic or dysregulated uh, issue there and they'll get fat independent of what they're eating, perhaps. But what links fat accumulation to our diet is, is insulin and, and glucagon to some extent and, and uh, growth hormone. And, and these all respond. So the carbohydrates, you eat them, they, they're going to stimulate insulin secretion. And the argument is those of us who get fat, those of us who put on fat easily are different from lean people. We're not genetically, just lean people. Genetically, or does this happen? Well, over biologically, the yeah. Genetically, ultimately. Um, we're not just lean people who ate too much. Okay, that's the conventional wisdom, right? The energy balance yeah. hypothesis is based on this crazy assumption that the, if you had two 18 year olds who are both six feet tall and 170 pounds and one of them at 40 is still six feet and 170 and the other one is blown up to 300 and you could find 
paired individuals like this all over the world effortlessly. The difference between the two is the one who stayed 170, balanced his intake to his expenditure, and the one who got to 300 didn't. Over mm -hmm. eight. You know, yeah. the guy should have eaten less and exercised more. That's the theory. And the other theory is this guy who got to 300 had some hormonal dysregulation that was driving his fat tissue to accumulate fat. And the way you fix that is you get rid of the carbs. Okay, the just, best you could do is get rid of the carbs. Just to be clear, um, you're saying is some of this uh, like through adolescence, you develop these things or is it from birth? It's you're just it, born. It's, I think a lot of it is programmed. A lot of chronic disorders. And this was a point that, you know, and when I get into the history, which I do a little bit in all my books and ideally I'll do exclusively in one or two more nutrition books. Um, you know, the genetic influences for chronic diseases aren't necessarily visible at first. You can, you know, be predisposed, have a genetic predisposition to a disease that, or a disorder that begins in adolescence or, you know, some of us are clearly, I mean, when you look at longevity, for instance, the greatest drivers of who lives to be 100 and who didn't are, you know, basically genetics. Uh -huh. Do you have genes that predispose you to health or do you have genes that predispose you to chronic diseases? So the idea with obesity is, uh, I think a lot of it is genetic. A lot of it is programmed in the womb. Uh, it's called, you know, epigenetic or intrauterine phenomena, depending on what the mother was eating and the mother's diet and the mother's, you know, yeah. weight and blood sugar. So there's status. like a Pottinger's then, cats type scenario going on. Uh, remind me of Pottinger's cats. It's like the third Been generation, the, the, the nutrition of the mother. There was two yes. uh, sets of cats. They fed one cooked food, one raw food. By the third generation of the cooked food diet, they couldn't reproduce. So I'm assuming along the way, there's a lot of like genetic alterations. Yeah, and you see this. I mean, this this uh, influence, uh, this uh, intrauterine phenomena has been documented re uh, especially well in the, the Pima Indian tribe in Arizona where the NIH has been studying. And, uh, you know, uh, if you're uh, the child of a mother who was diabetic during pregnancy, I think you're, you have a 30 or 40 fold increased risk of becoming diabetic or obese yourself mm -hmm. in adulthood. I mean, it's a crazy powerful mm -hmm. phenomenon. I think much of the obesity epidemic has been driven in effect by these intergenerational effects. Um, you just get to the point where, you know, some large percentage of all mothers when they get pregnant because of their blood sugar and weight status are going to drive obesity and diabetes in their kids. But that's yeah. a difference. It's not about how much they're, it doesn't drive these kids to, you know, doesn't affect their brain in some way that they can eat more. It affects their body to want to accumulate fat. And yeah. that in turn makes them hungry. It's a different causality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like we don't think about that enough, because if you think about sort of the evolution of the modern diet, really like the 70s, like with the Wonder Bread era, I feel like that was that was where we were just fully accepting of like each new food innovation. And we're kind of the products of the those parents, you know, like the parents that were eating that food. So we're like in Pottinger's cats, we're like the second generation. Yes. And uh, hopefully some of us are correcting to make the future a little bit easier on our kids. But now we got even more stuff to blame our parents for. Well, this uh, is if, you know, I, I ideal world, I keep thinking, how would you fix this? Especially in, in like Native American tribes, which are just, um, you know, they've been pounded by these obesity and diabetes epidemics. And so they, imagine, could you do a clinical trial where you randomize mothers to a ketogenic diet, assuming you get an institutional review board to allow you to do it, and then randomize them to a ketogenic diet or whatever the standard dietary prescription is, which I'm sure is fruits, vegetables, whole grains, you know, the traditional healthy diet. And then you'd want to follow their children from birth onward. Mm -hmm. And ideally, you'd be able to do this study for, you know, follow these kids for 40 years. And I would bet that the, you could return populations to, you know, a healthy normal. You could reverse these epigenetic effects, the Pottinger's cats generational effects. But somebody has to want to do that trial. An institutional review board has to sign off on it. And then you've got to be able to follow it for 40 years and have patience and uh, you know, we talked before we went on the air about the latest nutritional research and how much stock I put in it and 
one of the reasons I put so little stock in it is because nobody has patience to do the kind of studies necessary. Yeah, it's almost like all the good ones have been done already, or at least like the best ones we're going to get, right? Uh, you know, it scares me to think so. But yeah, that's, <laughs> it's, you know, and those are ambiguous. Those were done to test the idea that dietary fat causes heart disease or premature death, and they failed to do it. So I think it did. It, uh, it's a weird situation. If you have a trial that costs $100 million, and you got to get the money to do that from from Congress. Congress only feels like the trial was successful as if you've confirmed your hypothesis. Yeah. So if you do the trial and it turns out your hypothesis is wrong, which is the reason why you do the trial, which is to test your hypothesis, then you know the congressman will treat you like you wasted their money. Yeah. I mean, it's a crazy situation, and it guarantees you know decades and decades of more bad science from from NIH. Yeah, it is tough to wade through all this stuff, which is why these books are great. I mean, this really does it for you. There's tons of citations in here. It uh, it gives you, if you're new to keto and you want, like a lot of people ask, what's a good keto book? These are great because it breaks down like what's wrong with conventional, like what we conventionally think of nutrition these days, like food pyramid type mm -hmm. of stuff. It presents evidence for the contrary, more of a keto low carb style diet. And it is a pretty good place to get started. I think all of them are good. You actually said Why We Get Fat is your, your best-selling book? That's my most popular. But now I would argue for uh, the case for keto as, uh, again, it takes kind of the last couple chapters of Why We Get Fat and unpack some. And then having had the opportunity to talk to, you know, 120 or so physicians basically do research for this book that did that you can do weekly for your uh, your podcast mm -hmm. um you know it allows me to say things like i think ted Naiman is a smart guy but i'm not i don't believe necessarily he's correct in part because there are all these other smart people doing something different seeing something he's not seeing yeah and the reason I wrote this is I want people to under if you're going to do keto or do a low carb high fat diet whatever you call it um, you really have to understand why it works, why you're, you should re seriously consider doing something for the rest of your life that the mainstream medical community thinks is, is uh, dangerous and you can't sustain, you know, and why you should get your doctor on board. So read the book, give it to your doctor, go to the library, check it out and give it to them. But, you, you know, it helps to have your physician on board so they're not working against you. They're working yeah. with you. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the practical application um, for the people. So we are currently running a challenge. We do this at the start of a lot of years, 30 days under 20 net carbs to start the year uh, for people that want to join up. And a common question is like, let's say standard American diet or McDonald's, you know, th three or four times a week. They're coming from that type of a diet. What's a good approach as far as diet adherence goes? Like, um, is it good to have the replacement foods like Quest bars, things like that, a lot of stevia, artificial sweeteners, or are you more a proponent of just cutting it out completely from day one? Well, I think everyone's different. Um, you know, personally for me, I, I would advocate going cold turkey. I think, you know, you're going to transition quicker. I think you can get rid of your sweet tooth pretty quickly if you're eating enough fat in your diet and you want to get rid of your sweet tooth. And frankly, you know, I find those sugar alcohols unbearable. I crave them when they're in the house. I eat them. And then for like the next six hours, I'm going, oh, Jesus, a taste in my mouth. Yeah, That's personal. I get the need. People's need to have sweets. So, I, you know, and again, the physicians I interviewed, they, they would say, look, it depends on my patient. They're looking at a patient who's burdened with obesity or diabetes. They want to get them off carbs. And they're kind of making a judgment in their head. Is this somebody I could, I could send off who could do this cold turkey? Or is this somebody who I have to work in slowly? I either maybe get them, get them to eat a healthy breakfast. Say, look, get rid of the cereal and the skim milk and the banana and eat eggs and bacon for breakfast. And I guarantee you won't be hungry until lunch. Mm -hmm. And you'll feel better in the morning or even, you know, intermittent fast or time restricted eating. Don't eat breakfast. And I guarantee, you know, after three or four days, um, is it somebody I have to get off sweets first? Like, can I get them off sweets, get them off the sugary beverages, and then I could work on getting them off starches and grains? Or, you know, is it somebody who could just embrace 
torpedo. When I did it, I thought of it as Atkins and I just embraced it. And, you know, for me, that worked. Most people, mm -hmm. men in particular, you tell them, look, just I'm your doctor. You're not going to kill yourself if you eat eggs and bacon for breakfast and, the, you know, the steak and green salad for lunch and, a, you know, half a roast chicken and some broccoli for dinner. And don't forget to add butter. Yeah. Um, you know, most men will be happy with that if they don't think it's going to kill them or their wives don't think it's going to kill them. Yeah. And then um, something I would consider like maybe a tier two uh, concern after you get past just the, the low carb aspect of it. A lot of people then they're questioning the fat to protein. So yeah. uh, we've interviewed a lot of people who are more of a high protein proponent and you seem to be more of a higher fat proponent. What's kind of the pros and cons of each? Well, you know, again, um, and high protein is interesting. So first of all, high protein is a, uh, it's, it's relative, right? Even if you're eating 30% of your calories from protein, which I think is what, you know, the high protein advocates would say is high protein, you're still getting 60% from fat. So you're still eating significant amount of fat. Um, the argument against protein is 60% of the calories, the amino acids in the protein are going to be broken down into converted to glucose. That glucose is going to stimulate insulin secretion. Um, if you are really burdened with obesity such that you really have to minimize insulin, if you're storing fat most of the time, even with just the insulin from the protein, you then you got to get rid of the protein and then, you know, up the fat intake. Traditionally, these diets have been, uh, you know, 5% carbs, 15% protein, and then 80% fat or 75, like 80% fat. four to one fat. ratio. Yeah. And when groups like Verda Health with their nutritional ketosis for type 2 diabetics, they're pushing them, you know, just like vegetables are, are something you eat because you can put olive oil or butter on them and increase yeah. your fat consumption. I get that a lot of people, particularly when they start thinking of this as keto rather than carb abstention. Um, I've talked to people who said, well, I don't really do keto because you know I don't have a bulletproof coffee every day. And yeah. so I understand the idea. And, you know, the, and I quote Ted Naiman talking about this in my book, you know, that people the problem is if you're infusing fat all day long by drinking, for instance, bulletproof coffees, which I love, but if you're infusing them all day long, then those, that's a period of time in which you're still, you're going to be burning the fat you're consuming and not accessing the fat that you've stored. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, I think it's an individual variation. I would try, I would start off with the traditional you know, relatively, I, I mean, I, I the, the idea of a skinless chicken breast, just, which is what I think of when people talk high protein, I find that, you know, it gives me the, like, creeps. I don't know the yeah. word anymore. I, I wish. No, I used to eat a lot of those. But yeah, it doesn't yeah, make sense anymore. Did. Yeah. We all did. And they're tasteless. Yeah, and in order to make it taste good, you either have to put butter or fat back on it, or you marinate it in some, you know, soy, sugar, fruit juice thing. Yeah. And then finally, it tastes good enough to eat. Now you've basically infused carbs back into it or, you know, yeah. it's just so that when I think high protein, that's what I think. It's like eat the chicken thighs with the skin, eat the breast with the skin. And I have photos getting back to the calorie issue. I have a chapter in the book where I discuss this and I just compare different breakfast, lunches and dinners. And I show how like a dinner, which has, you know, a couple of skinless chicken breasts, broccoli and a mashed potato um, can be replaced by dinners with, you know, chicken thighs with the skin on it mm -hmm. yeah. and a little more broccoli and a pat of butter on the broccoli and the calories are identical. And one is keto and a weight loss diet and the other is what got you fat or kept you fat to begin with. Mm -hmm. you, you can match it for calories. And when you just look at it like that, it seems fairly obvious. And none of the keto meals, I got a breakfast, a lunch and a dinner are not a lot. I mean, it's just, it's just the same. It's just matching calorie for calorie, what the standard American or healthy American diet would have been. Yeah. And then, um, 
a lot of the uh, maybe opponents of yours would they they cite these. I think there's a few studies where there's like a, a hospital feeding study where they mess with the macro ratios, but the calories are controlled. And there's been. Do, do you know the ones I'm talking about? And the weight loss is very similar. Uh, yeah, but there's a God, there's multiple issues with his trials. I always have. Um, you know, with the not for profit I co founded with Peter Atia, Nusi funded uh, several of these trials. So, um, two of them. And uh, they had pros and cons, they got different results. Uh, the ones who got a result that could be consistent with the conventional thinking, although I would argue that it wasn't. This was in the from one of the principal investigators with National Institutes of Health Researcher insisted that because this could be consistent with conventional thinking on calories, it proved the calorie theory was correct. And we never have to discuss this ever again. And then the other study, which was funded, which was at Harvard, which also was much more consistent with the idea that obesity is a hormonal regulatory disorder dominated by insulin and carbs, that got that finding. And you know, science is messy like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the expensive experiments fail. Sometimes they succeed. And the problem is when they people define success as, did it give me an answer consistent with my preconceptions? Mm -hmm. So if I did yeah. the experiment and it, just, it the answer that I kind of got seemed to confirm my preconceptions, therefore that experiment is correct. And that's the one I'm going to quote, um, you know, to me, and I make this point in the new book and I make it as often as I can, when you, all we're saying is, look, obesity is a sort of excess fat accumulation, right? Fundamentally, the problem we all had was that we were getting fat or, or our blood sugar was out of control or our blood pressure. But what we're interested here is fat accumulation. And when you look at the regulation of fat accumulation, this is what I mean by textbook medicine. It's dominated by the hormone insulin and accepted in this domination of insulin is the idea that if you want to get fat out of your fat cells, you've got to have the what a Nobel laureate in 1965 called the negative stimulus of insulin deficiency. That's what determines whether or not fat cells will accumulate, will hold on to fat or release them. Mm -hmm. And that this is, 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 you know, relevant to human obesity. And it goes along with 200 years of thinking that carbohydrates were fattening. You know? Yeah, that's kind of the frustrating thing with reading the book is you're you're showing like we've known this for a long time. <laughs> it's uh it's nothing new here, guys. Uh it's it's just are we making progress, do you think, or or where are we in this whole crazy timeline of, of modern diets? Well, we are. I mean, I'm sure any day the U U.S. News and World Report is going to come out with their annual diet ratings. I'm surprised we haven't seen it so far. And they're probably going to say, as at least until now, they have always uh, insisted that low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic diets are the least healthy. Yeah, it's always last. Yeah. And um, <laughs> it's funny because, again, if you just go to clinicaltrials.gov, put in ketogenic as a keyword, and you'll come up with it was of this morning, there were something like 260 trials of which 100 had been completed. And the findings are universally that this diet is beneficial. I, I always look at why they rate it last. And weirdly enough, it's because of the adherence is very, they, they say it's very hard to adhere to. Yeah, well, this is, you know, the, the conventional wisdom is that, yeah, I don't understand the idea. You're not going to... Uh, promote this diet or tell people they should eat it because it's unsustainable. Well, what's unsustainable is not eating. Is it? I mean, I use cigarettes as an example a lot because I used to be a smoker. And uh, when I even talking to these physicians, they tend to think of their patients as, you know, carbohydrate dependent or carbohydrate addicted. So clearly, you know, populations thrived in human history without any carbohydrates, without a pancake or a donut or a cinnamon bun or a, even yeah. a baked potato. Um, you know, we know that for sure. So we know that humans can thrive on these diets. The question is, can people, is it worth it? If you really understand what's happening. So you understand that carbohydrates are fattening. That's the simplistic way to describe everything going on here. 
and you go off carbs and you lose say 50 or 100 pounds and you're healthy and you feel good are you going to go back to eating them because you miss them so much and some people might but again then is are they happy that they did that because the weight will come back that's a guarantee and the reason you know getting to smoking i quit smoking because i knew that smoke cigarettes would kill me you know and i knew i mean they made me feel bad i coughed all the time i had bad breath i mean it was you know it's it, it wasn't i didn't enjoy smoking even though i lived to do it so you know, most people who try to quit smoking fail, but they don't tell you don't try because it's unsustainable. They say, if you fail, try again, keep trying. And now here, let me give you nicotine gum or nicotine patches or even hypnosis to help you quit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for those of us, the argument is for those of us who get fat and diabetic, it's the carbs in the diet that trigger it. And, you know, it's unfortunate, it's unfair for us that we can't eat them if we don't want to be, you know, overweight or obese, but we can't. That's the what the biology tells us, if I'm right. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of a fallacy, mm -hmm. too, in where they're probably gauging sustainability based on how far you're deviating from, like, the standard. And, uh, and where, where it may just be more sustainable to drastically deviate from the standard. Like, a keto diet is a pretty drastic departure from well, a normal diet. Well, not only that, if you're giving people the wrong advice, the assumption that the diets are unsustainable in general is based on the idea that when we've told people to diet in the past, they haven't kept with it. Mm -hmm. And yet when they've told people to diet in the past, they've always been giving them the wrong advice if people like us are right. So you would be crazy to stick with something. Nobody's going to sustain something that doesn't work. You know, yeah, that true. shows you no benefits. You'd be, and this is, this again is why I thought about calling this book in praise of fad diets. Like the idea is you're supposed to be able to sustain being hungry all the time and then exercise more, which will make you even hungrier. And yeah. you're supposed to sustain that because God forbid you should exercise and then, you know, uh, uh, eat to satisfy that hunger. So that was a failure. We know, and it's again, I'm working on a book on diabetes now, and this theme comes up over and over again in the diabetes literature. I mean, even the latest standard of care guidelines from the American Diabetes Association, the diet guideline is they tell the doctors to tell their patients that they can continue to eat as many carbohydrates as they always ate, because that way the doctor can trust that the patient will take their advice. So the logic isn't to make the patient as healthy as possible and to start there. The logic is to make sure the patient's listening by telling them to just keep doing what you've always been doing. And our argument is, look, if somebody, if the dietary advice is correct, if it targets the problem correctly, then this will fix it. And the problem in this case is this intolerance for carbohydrates. Again, it's unfortunate, but we could also be confident that when people don't eat them, they'll be they'll they'll adjust to diet high in fat, and that's what they'll crave. And if they fix their problem, they'll be happy to sustain it. And I use a very, you know, kind of a banal example of this. When I was a kid, I had a corn. I still I had a corn allergy my whole life. But when I was a kid, when I was five years old, if I ate corn or anything with corn in it, I would get cramps and it was excruciatingly uncomfortable and GI problems. And so my mother drags me to the allergist. They do allergy tests that comes back that I'm allergic to corn. I haven't eaten corn. I don't eat corn. You know, I don't feel like I'm in danger of being in a, the eating disorder or that I'm food restricting in some way that's unsustainable. I don't want the cramps. I don't want the GI problems. And if I am confronted with a corn product that I really want to eat popcorn in a movie theater or corn on the cob, of, you know, early summer, then I'm willing to eat it and take pay the penalty. But I know it's a short term penalty. Yeah. You know, the argument here is, look, it's easy. What you're sustaining is basically being healthy. And many people are going to do that if the diet, if what they're doing is actually making them healthy. Yeah. Uh, so getting to a few questions here in the chat, I don't know if you've actually have a view on this. I haven't heard it before. Uh, obviously, carnivore diet is, is the rage these days. 
And uh, the whole idea of like plant toxicity, anti-nutrients, do you have a view on that at all? Well, I'm skeptical of the science, the plant toxicity issue, just because I'm skeptical of all science, uh, new science, um, until, um, you know, carnivore clearly helps people. Uh, to me, the real benefit is probably the extreme. It's a, it is the extreme version of carb restriction other than just living on butter all day long, which would be an interesting experiment, but not one I would recommend. Um, you know, I discuss this issue in a chapter in the book that um, the end of chapters towards the end, I'll start with a quote from one of the physicians I interviewed. And in this case was Carrie Doulis, who's a spine surgeon in Ohio. And Carrie is a, uh, she comes from a family with a, a history of obesity. And she said if she hadn't figured out her diet, she'd have been 300 pounds. She also has type one diabetes. She'd probably been blind by now. Um, instead, she's very healthy and she thrives. And she found that she can't tolerate animal products in her diet. Carrie would be a good person to interview. She, she eats a vegan ketogenic diet, or she did when I interviewed her. And she said, it's not a religion. It's just about how I feel. And she advocates her patients eat a ketogenic diet. And if they're not ethically opposed to eating animals, she advocates that they eat animals. Um, and I play off in this chapter, Carrie against Georgia Eads, who's uh, a psychologist in Western Massachusetts, who found that she can't tolerate plant foods and has done a lot of the writing on plant toxicity and Georgia eats a carnivore diet, also keto. And so Georgia and Carrie are completely in alignment. It's just what their bodies can tolerate or can't. And I, you know, I would experiment with a carnivore diet, but my wife is a mostly vegetarian and I don't think my marriage can, I don't want to put my marriage under that kind of strain. Although I thought about it after a few days of eating badly over the holidays and my new year's resolution might be a one month carnivore test to see, you know, just out of curiosity. And I advocate yeah. people experiment. Once we know these diets are not going to kill us and we know that they're benign, then if you've got a health issue that isn't um, resolving on a sort of classic low carb, high fat ketogenic diet, then experiment with what it is in your diet that might be triggering it. And if it means you end up a carnivore, but that's what it takes for you to feel good, then I'm all for it. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind of on the same page. I think it's, uh, people are, are really attracted to the extremes because I think that just gets back to the modern dieting mindset. They think the more extreme, the better. When I think you almost have to take the reverse view at this point, like, like, don't be as extreme, do something slow and steady that you can do for a really long time. That's well, yeah. And that's, that's what I would advise. I mean, if somebody who tells me I'm going to eat nothing but meat for the rest of my life, isn't thinking that far ahead, what the rest of my life is going to look like, yeah. how my meal might uh, differ from my wife's meal. Again, it's interesting. A marriage between a vegetarian and a, and a, a mostly carnivore is like a Muslim and a Jew on many levels. I uh -huh. mean, you know, um, I, I have a wonderful, I love my wife and I have a wonderful family. And, but, you know, going out to a restaurant is like, where are we going to go that she's going to get something she likes and I'm going to get something I like. Um, so the more extreme it is, the harder. Now, if you could find someone who shares your extreme views on dieting, then that's ideal. Yeah. But even that might change with time. So, you know, it's kind of, and there's a lot to be said. One of the reasons why the medical community is worried by ketogenic diets is because they seem radical to them and radical things are come with risks that they don't understand. What they haven't understood is that the diet they've been uh, advocating for for 50 years also comes with risks and what we think are clear negative, you know, clear complications in terms of weight and blood sugar. But yeah. on some level, the, you know, what what conclusions can we make about how we should eat based on a you know, dietary history of the human species? And clearly, you know, we were carnivores, but omnivores more so than car carnivores. And then, um, you know, how does it make me feel? And can I trust that it's been tested enough that, you know, something horrible isn't going to happen? 
I think that's really sort of the missing link of, of us mo- like living in modern society is how does it make me feel? Number one, you can't really trust it because we're so just like detached from, from that connection that, that we used to have as humans, where you eat something and it makes you feel bad. You actually tie those things together. Like people take their two o'clock nap after their pasta work lunch and they don't even connect the two barely. Um, cause well, we're none so- of us did. I mean, I yeah. took that nap every day. Yeah, same. <laughs> I used to say that I didn't take naps. Naps took me. <laughs> You know, if we were doing this interview at two o'clock, I'd be thinking, oh, my God, I got to get off. I'm about to. And there's nothing worth giving talks after lunch talks in this era. Yeah. And it's like I'm just I prepare myself like don't get upset when five percent of your audience falls asleep during the talk. It's not because you're boring. It's because <laughs> of what they ate at lunch. Yeah. But yeah, it's sort of uh, how does this make me feel? And we don't we weren't taught to think like that. We were taught this is a healthy diet, and we know this is a healthy diet because statistical surveys of healthy people suggest this is what they tend to eat. And you should eat this, and if you eat this, you'll live longer, but we have no data that that's really true. And if you feel bad or you're getting fat or you're getting diabetic or you're falling asleep after lunch every day, that's that's just life. That's the best you can yeah. do. And... Uh, it's interesting. One one of the physicians I interviewed was a guy named uh, Dr. Andreas in um, a small town outside of Vancouver. He's South African. And he said, you know, as a he's really smart, thoughtful guy, and he said, you know, as a, as a physician, we've been taught to prescribe diets by hypothesis. So we have this hypothesis that if I give you a low-fat diet, mostly plants, fruits, vegetables, or Mediterranean diet, you will live longer. You'll have less chronic disease. Um, There's actually nothing I can really measure that'll tell me if that's true. I mean, maybe your LDL will come down a little if you eat that. But, um, you know, if you live 50 years or 70 years or 30 years, I won't know what role the diet played if you have a heart attack. So it's purely a hypothesis-generated diet. And the flip side is if I tell you to go low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic diet, I can actually watch you get healthier. Over the course of three months, you'll lose weight, your blood sugar will come under control, your blood pressure will come under control, I can get you off these drugs, you'll feel better. But the hypothesis is that diet's bad for you. Yeah. So it's like, am I going to give you prescribe a diet by hypothesis or a diet by observ- like sort of clinical observation, which is what medicine used to be before the evidence-based medicine movement came in. And... Um, you know, my argument and his argument is, look, just you can do this. You can try it yourself. I mean, if you want to try carnivore, try carnivore, extreme as it is, and you can see how you feel. And the thing is, do it right. You know, don't do it half-assed. Don't do like, I'm going to do keto, except I'm going to have a donut every other day, you know, and then occasional Coca-Cola because I miss my Cokes. Um, Do it right. See how you feel and keep it up long enough so you can really get a feel for what the benefits are for, you know. And the physicians I, I, I talked to, and again, a lot of them are family medicine and internal medicine. They basically said, I just feel like if I can get people to do this for, you know, weeks, a few weeks, a few months, I know they will feel better. I know they'll decide it's worth it. That's what I want to get my patients to do. Yeah. Um, so in going through the book, I haven't fully finished it, The Case for Keto, and you can get it on all the all the bookstores, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all those places. Yeah. Can you get it at your website too? Or uh, Yeah, if you go to garytalbs.com slash keto, it'll then take you to Amazon. Um, okay. The, uh, you know, if the local bookstore is still open in your neighborhood, buy it there. Uh, if not, I always yeah, get them used, that. but that doesn't that doesn't make you money. And not particularly, <laughs> but I'm more, I, well, I am interested in putting my kids through college someday if they ever get off Fortnite and Apex Legends long <laughs> enough to, yeah. but um, yeah, so I can't deny that making a living is not part of my motivation here, but I'm more interested in getting people healthy and getting them and their doctors to understand why this is something they should really seriously consider trying and understanding. Yeah, you're definitely on the front lines. And I think more now, now more than ever, it's really like the intellectuals do battle and they shape the minds because it's so like it's out there for everyone to watch and read. And like, you know, you really shape a lot of minds with these books and these interviews and stuff. So 
you're really an important person in this whole drive for for low carb. Um, but on to the, the last couple of questions, I guess, in the book, uh, the primary focus from what I've read, I haven't finished it, maybe I missed this part, is uh, mainly focusing on the carbs, the refined carbs, just eliminating the carbs. How do you feel about like the vegetable oils, uh, high polyunsaturated fats in the diet? Is that a big concern of yours or is that that come later? Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know what to make of that data. And I've had d- discussions with you know, my friends in the community who think vegetable oils are the, I mean, I know people who think that they're worse than carbs. Um, I just don't know what to make of that data. Uh, there's some good the hypotheses being generated that these are terrible. Um, uh, I could imagine that they play important, they play roles in heart disease, but I would expect them some signal that they're bad to show up in the epidemiologic data and it doesn't. And I would expect the clinical trials to show some evidence that these are bad and they're very ambiguous. Um, The results are all over the place. Uh, What I know is if you can get people off refined grains and sugars, you're not gonna have many products left that have seed oils in them. Yeah. And I don't recommend eating with seed oils just on the basis of this sort of evolutionary argument that they're new to human diets. They're as likely to do harm as to do good. And there are older fats, vintage fats is a term that I borrowed from uh, Adele Heights uh, book with her colleague. And, um, you know, that, that you can eat, if you're eating whole foods, then getting your fats from natural sources, it's not going to be a huge deal. If it uh-huh. turns out it is, why well, can't I, mean, I just say, you know, I, I don't know what to make of that, but it, you'll end up, if you're not eating processed foods, you won't be getting a significant yeah. amount of poofas. Okay. Um, yeah, we, I think we've got to make like some cool phrases, make this diet more cool, like vintage, eat vintage, eat retro, like people love retro stuff. <laughs> For, yeah, like, you know, the... As soon as you turn 30, you're just like looking back at all the, these cool retro things from your childhood and you start buying them all. It's a really good market to get into. Um, and you're okay, well, I will keep that in mind. The retro, you know. <laughs> and um, then I did want to double back on the foreign TV we should be watching on Netflix. Do you? It sounded like you had a little something for us. Oh, Christ, there's great TV out there. Um, I, I got one for you too. Okay, so uh, there's a, for instance, there's a Catalan TV show from Spain called Merli. I don't know how it's correctly pronounced. M-E-R-L-I. Okay. Uh, it's on Netflix. There's only one season available. It's a, easily in my top 10 Subtitle? TV shows. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, who, who speaks Catalan outside of, you know, that region of Spain? The, um... It's about a teacher, a high school teacher, a, a uh, you know, one of these inspiring high school teachers who's also got some serious character defects, including sleeping with the mothers of the students. Um, you know, there's a, some great Danish shows we've been watching lately, and uh, I got into an Australian TV show kick where uh, there's a show called Rake about a rakish, uh, sleazy Australian uh, defense attorney that the first three episodes for three seasons are brilliant. Then it goes off the rail. Is it courtroom but, drama? I love courtroom drama. It is, but it's, it's him and the women in his life and his drug issues and his alcohol problems. And, okay. uh, it's the first couple episodes you have to sort of deal with, cause he's not really a likable character. Then you start getting emotionally drawn in. So Okay. Have you? I got two for you. Have you seen the series on HBO, Succession? Oh yeah, no, I love Succession. Such Waiting a great for it show. To come back. Yeah. And One then, of the shows I was going to recommend, by the way, there's a Danish show called um, The Legacy, not to be confused with Legacy. I think it's also it's Netflix or Amazon Prime. Okay. It's about uh, the death of a, a matriarch and a wealthy danish family and it feels like it was directed by the directors of succession okay i'll Probably check that wasn't, one out. but it feels like it yeah that sounds right up my alley and then the, this new one i just finished it's so good it's on hulu it is called the great the great it's a period it's like a period comedy 
Oh, about uh, Catherine the Great. Yes, that and it's one. So it's such a it's it's like no show I've ever seen before. It's funny. It's serious. It's it's like really great. Yeah, you know, we watched the first episode. My wife, I would have kept going. She didn't like uh, it. My wife thought the humor was a little um, coarse. It is a little a little coarse for sure. And not that she's adverse to coarse humor, but for some reason it didn't resonate with her. But um, I will put it back on our list. You know, okay. we do. It's not to say that we're the dullest family in America, but particularly in the time of COVID, you get, you know, the children are off on their screens playing their games and talking to their friends through 18 different devices by 8 o'clock at night. And it's like, it's, it's just, the TV is so great. Yeah at this day and age i don't feel guilty watching it it's like it's just it's the goal it's you know terrific writing great characters and yeah um yeah so um since i do have a newborn son what what's the deal with like screen time and do you limit any of that stuff or is it free for i all? mean it's interesting because you know my last book was a case against sugar and i would invariably talk about the ask about whether sugar was addicting and I would say, well, the science is, you know, it's hard. There's really not a lot of research on it. But if you got kids, you don't need science to tell you it's a problem. There's only two yeah. things you have to ration with children nowadays, and it's kids and screen time. And the screen time is as big. Like during COVID, m- many of us lost that battle. We just, your kids are home all the time. They can't, you know, my kids, they, their idea of a outing with their friends is to go to Safeway and buy junk food and then to eat it before they get home. I'll we'll see it. I know what they're doing, but um, so yeah, it's a problem. I mean, I worry about it. I, I justify it by saying that's going to be their future, right? So yeah. Um, and if I was their age, I would be as addicted to these games as they are, but we didn't have those, that opportunity. So where it's kind of an experimental generation of children we could limit their time, but then literally, what are they going to do? They're trapped at home. I mean, my youngest son is a basketball nut, so I can get him out playing basketball a couple hours a day, but that still leaves sort of 16 hours to. Yeah. And I almost, how... I almost think like when, when I was growing up, it was kind of like a lot of the kids spent a lot of time on video games, but there was some that didn't. It was more of like uh-huh. a, we're now everyone does it i almost feel like the differentiation of a child that's really raised like with no screens it could be quite extreme to where like they're really in a unique creative space where because all these other kids are just doing the same thing with the screens it's but, true but i have uh i very close to a family where the kids were raised without television and both these kids are exceedingly bright but they're also sort of disassociated from their peers in a way yeah, that is not particularly else because they don't have the same touchstones, the same, you know, the, it's as though they live in a different world. Yeah, it's like if you and didn't it, watch Tiger King, who do you t- who do you yeah. talk to? <laughs> <laughs> you know, sort of. I mean, in my generation, if you didn't watch uh, The Sopranos, but no, it's yeah. sort of if you didn't watch any of it. Yeah. So. It's an interesting, I mean, clearly there are kids out there who I think are going to have competitive advantages over my children because they, their parents did a better job of shutting down. And of course, every new year they go back to school in two days and I think, okay, that's it. We're going to, I've got devices and, and, and Wi-Fi monitors and I'm going to set strict <laughs> timing. But then the question is, what are they going to do? How much can I really expect them to read and study? Yeah. When, you know, again, when we were kids, we were free range kids, right? So we were just out playing. I was, you know, in one of my friend's yards growing up playing some sporting thing for four yeah. hours a day because that's what we did. But they don't have that. And we live in an area, Burke, Oakland, California, where the lawns aren't even big enough to, you know, um, yeah. play the sport. Of this. So what are they going to do? And I don't, you know, I'd love it if they, my, I had a kid who was reading his physics books two hours a day, but yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I wouldn't yeah, have been. Tough. Yeah. I'm only, so. I'm only at the tip of the iceberg, but it seems like there's going to be a lot of tough decisions along the way, but I've kept you for, for uh, too long already. So. Well, I'm going to say one thing, just wait okay. until the first time when you're on like an airplane and you realize you give your child that yeah. iPad or the phone and they're, 
they're like they're not a problem anymore That's, and suddenly yeah. it's like it's like you've given them a little bit of heroin <laughs> yeah but it's made your life easier yeah that's so gonna be that's, tough. That's the catch. It makes your life. The reason I have time to watch TV is because my kids are. I'm not, I don't have to play Scrabble with my boys who are busy playing, shooting, posing teams on various virtual worlds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally understandable. It's gonna be tough, but uh, yeah, the book, guys, the case for keto in bookstores now. Get a copy. It's on Amazon. Go through Gary's website. It's GaryTobs.com. Yes. And uh, I would recommend uh, Why We Get Fat is a little bit of like a shorter shorter book, maybe easier to read. To me, Good Calories, Bad Calories, that was what first got me into keto. But really, any of his books are really great. Uh, the Case Against Sugar is another one. And w what are the ones I'm missing here? I only got four of them. Uh, no, those are, the, uh, those are the nutrition books. I wrote two books earlier in my life on bad science and physics and, uh, and nuclear chemistry. And that's oh, okay. what sort of my learning experience and what is technically known as pathological science that the nutrition and obesity researchers have perfected. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, those are the nutrition books. Good calories and bad calories is worth reading because it, it really covers the the gamut of the, the history and the, the science uh, how we got into this and yeah. the various implications of it because there are implications everywhere mm -hmm. everywhere you turn this bad nutrition science and bad obesity science has, has sort of infected and and harmed chronic disease research and how we think about it mm -hmm. well thanks so much for taking the time uh maybe we'll have you back on for the, the next book that would be great look forward to it